good to see you. Was that not awesome? I just love being in the Father's house with you, having this, this team lead us to the throne. It is awesome. Week after week, we never take it for granted. And God is here, and he's here because of the faithful saints who are praying and interceding. And we want to continue to remember our Ghana missionaries as they are right there on the front lines presenting the gospel. And I want to thank you guys for yesterday. So many of you came out across this state, across the country, uh, across all of North Carolina for our first ever attempt at a statewide prayer walk, and it was awesome. The reports are coming in all over of lives being changed and seeds being planted. But more than that, we were able to show unity in Christ. And that is something a lost and dying world desperately needs to see among the bride of Christ. Amen? You know what I'm talking about? They need to look at us and say, you know, I don't understand everything about them, but I know this. Look how they love each other. And I want some of that. And it was awesome. And I'm just so grateful that we have so many prayer warriors, but also some great pastors who have gotten together and put egos aside. And, and, and my heart, you know, is for other pastors who are kingdom-minded, who don't care about competition. It don't matter. I'm so excited when another church does awesome and grows because it's all God's church anyway. And uh, God is doing some amazing things. So I just wanted to thank you. And, and I'm so fired up today because we're starting a new series called Evidence. And I'm a nerd. I admit it. This is what I love. I nerd out on this stuff. If you're into like CSI and mysteries and whodunit and uh, courtroom dramas and you can't handle the truth, things like that, you're going to love this. You know, I first started talking to Pastor Jason about this. I thought it was going to be a one or two weeker, but good night. There's so much great stuff in Passion Week and what happens over the next two to three Sundays when we look at Palm Sunday and we look at Easter and Resurrection Sunday and all the things that lead up to it. And there is something very bizarre that happens prior to that. We've never looked at it as a church. Since I've been pastor, I've never preached on this. But I want to examine what happened before the crucifixion. And I want to look at this trial. I got to study in it, and I've been reading some great articles on it, and it just blew my mind how much stuff is there that we glean and we, that we, we fail to, to understand just how much the Father had a plan. And at the end of this two, three weeks, I want you to feel so edified in what Jesus did for you. The church is his bride, and he is coming back for the church. And this is, just, I want to tell you, I'm going to give you a heads up. This is going to be like drinking from a fire hose, all right? I'm going to open it up, and it's going to be a little different, and we're going to go. So get your notes out, get your pens out. I hope you brought your Bible. Go ahead and find Matthew 26. Just kind of hold your place there. I like to set the context, and I want to welcome our online guest. If you're a first-timer and you're checking us out, from a safe distance, I get it. Come on in. We won't bite. We love having you with us. You make our services better. Uh, my name is Pastor Matt, by the way. I had the honor of helping launch this church 20 years ago this month. And so we'd love to come and meet you. Come up. If you're here visiting in the room, thank you for being here. I'd love to shake your hand afterwards and talk to you, answer any questions you have. All right, I'll give you time to find it. Matthew 26. I'm going to read mostly from the CSB today. And I chose that because it's a very literal, very straightforward very conservative translation of the scriptures. And I love that. Remember, go back to the most conservative viewpoint you can find for it. You can always go out from there and take things more uh, figuratively if you want. But start there. Give God a chance to say what he says in its simplest form. These first five verses in chapter 26, you're going to see the plot to kill Jesus happen. Y'all, it is so weird. There is so much odd stuff happening here, stuff that shouldn't have happened. And my question is, why did it? Why, why did this bizarre stuff happen? Look with me starting in verse 1, chapter 26. So when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he told his disciples, you know that the Passover takes place after two days, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. All right, they didn't like hearing this. They're like, what's going on? Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the courtyard of the high priest. Notice where they're assembling. That was Caiaphas. And they conspired to arrest Jesus in a really nice legal way to kill him. What does your say? Treacherous? Some of you may have a different translation. Illegal? Yep. To kill him. Verse 5 says, oh, not during the festival. Don't do it then, they said, so there won't be rioting among the people, right? Because they're so concerned for the people, so concerned about doing things righteously and just, right? This is setting up the night where Judas betrays Jesus. We see that for 30 pieces of silver, he goes to the chief priest. This is the night the disciples are going to gather in the upper room. They have their final meal. This is what inspired what we call the Lord's Supper today. So if you're new to the faith, this is why we say these things, because Jesus said them that night, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Drink this. This is this blood. It's the new covenant. 
and, and all these great things. He's wanting you to remember this. All this happens on this night. This is a huge night. The disciples will eventually desert him. Peter, the great and mighty Peter, will deny knowing him three times before sunrise because we know that the rooster crows. All of this happens. This is the night Jesus goes into a garden. He kneels down, and he's praying to his father so intently that he sweats drops of blood, and he says, Father, if there's any way this cup can pass for me, that'd be awesome. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. This is the Son of God himself praying these heartfelt prayers, okay? Then in verse 47, we see that this large mob shows up in the garden. There's clubs, there's swords. They come. The chief priests and the elders are with them. This is a really weird setup. This is not normal, guys. We think it's normal because we've read it a hundred times. They come up, and they literally take hold of Jesus, and they arrest him. But I want us to notice what Jesus' reaction is here. What is his response? And check out verse 56 for special attention, all right? Read it with me, starting verse 55. At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, these are the clubs and the knives and the sword guys who come up, have you come out here with all this as if I were a criminal to capture me? Every day I used to sit teaching in the temple, and you never arrested me. But all this has happened so that the writings of the prophets would be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. All right, so here we go. Jesus is about to face the Sanhedrin. All the religious leaders in this bizarre trial, and I use quotes for a reason, begins. And I want you to tell me how many strange and odd things you can count in this next few uh, verses. Starting verse 57, those who had arrested Jesus led him away to Caiaphas and the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had convened. Peter was following him at a distance right into the high priest's courtyard. He went in, and he was sitting with the servants to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin we're looking for false testimony against Jesus so that he could be put to death, but they couldn't find any. Even though many false witnesses came forward, finally, two who came forward stated, this man's playing Galaga. No, he said, this man said, I can destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. That's not what he said, by the way. Verse 52, 62, the high priest stood up and he said to him, don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. This was huge for him to do this. Tell us right now, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? I love Jesus' response. Said, You've said it. But I'll tell you this. In the future, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes, and he said, he has blasphemed. Why do we still need any more witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What's your decision, guys? And they answered, he deserves death. And they spat in his face, and they beat him. Others slapped him. This is the part where Luke says they blindfolded him, by the way. And they punched him, and they smacked him. And they, they mocked him and said, hey, prophesy to us, Messiah. Who's hitting you now? What a bizarre trial. He's standing here, blameless, innocent, being mocked. There's so much going on in this passage that I have read it a thousand times, and I never caught the magnitude of what Jesus allowed to happen for me and for you. This is going to change and have you, you're going to walk with such an appreciation for the Lord today. When you look at this all the legal experts who look at this say there is something so not right with this whole trial. Proverbs 17, 15 makes a very unique proclamation. It says this. I want you to look at it. It says, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. Right? So knowing that is our reference from the Old Testament, let me ask a few tough questions. How does this verse relate to what happened with the trial of Jesus. Did they condemn the righteous? Were they wicked? Was this God's plan? Or how about this one? Was this trial even legal? And if so, why did God allow it? What is happening here? So as I looked into this, I read a great article by Mike Leake. I don't know him. He's a, a pastor and author. He wrote 
torn to heal and Jesus is all you need. But he had a fantastic article where he was quoting scholars that have up to 18, at least, illegalities that happened in this trial. If it wasn't illegitimate, it was absolutely illegal. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all 18, but I am going to give you the top 10 because this stuff is so good. It's rapid fire. Here we go. This is the first thing I noticed, all right? Humanly speaking, now I'm speaking humanly, based on the evidence, Jesus should have never been arrested. Did you ever think of that? Humanly speaking, he should have never been arrested. First off, Judas took a bribe from the judges. That's your first disclaimer right there. He took a bribe from the judges. Those are the same judges, including the priests and the elders, who are going to be involved in the arrest of Jesus. And there was no formal charge, no crime listed. The text says they literally came up and seized him. They took him. And from there, man, we're off to the races, a dubious race. The second illegality I notice here is there's no legal proceedings that should have taken place at night. This didn't happen. Every practicing Jew back then knew this. Something was horribly wrong. According to the Jewish law, the Sanhedrin have a, a, an oral Torah. It's called the Mishnah. And this is all their collections. And they held it in esteem like the Torah. They called it the oral Torah, the Mishnah. The Mishnah says this, let a capital offense, that's what this was now, let a capital offense be tried only during the day and suspended at night. They didn't do that. Maimonides, great theologian from Sanhedrin 3, said this, the reason why a trial of a capital offense can never be held at night is because, as our tradition says, the examination of such a heavy charge is like diagnosing a wound. So he's comparing it to a doctor who you bring an open wound to him and you say, hey, how about we examine this into this dim candlelight here and then you operate on it. It would never happen. They would examine you in the wound in the light of day with sunlight and clear. That's how seriously they took this. They would never diagnose or operate under the cover of darkness. According to the New Testament, Jesus was arrested at night, and then he was whisked away to this guy's courtyard, the Caiaphas, and we're told all this took place before the rooster crowed at sunrise. So this is being rushed through, which leads you to point number three. No trial for a capital offense could begin on a Friday or the day before an annual festival day. They did both. That's exactly what happened. No court of justice in Israel was permitted to hold sessions on the Sabbath or any of the seven biblical days. In the case of a capital crime, no trial could begin on a Friday, and it can't, it, it can't carry over the weekend. But this is precisely what happened to Jesus. It was the day before the Sabbath and on the first day of unleavened bread. So there's so much rank hypocrisy, so much wrong going on. All right, moving on. Number four, a trial for a capital offense must take more than one day. This isn't just somebody's wishes. This is according to their Mishnah. It says, quote, if the sentence of death is to be pronounced, a criminal cannot charge and be concluded in the same day. It must happen. It cannot before the following day. So what they're saying is this has to allow time for other witnesses, for a defense to come and support the accused. But the entire trial of Jesus is started and wrapped up in under nine hours. Do we realize that? This is unheard of. This is so wrong. And this next one is a biggie. The judges were not impartial. Like, at all. The Sanhedrins are the ones bringing the charges, and they're the ones hopping over here and putting on the judges' robes, and they're being also the witnesses for the crime. And the witnesses continued to lie and make all kinds. There was no formal indictment. The witnesses spoke right there in the public assembly. That's the first time Jesus heard any of the evidence. And it was supposed to agree, and it didn't. There's a great guy in the criminal jurisprudence of ancient Hebrews named uh, Mendelssohn. And he, he says, there cannot be evidence presented unless two have gathered and formed a legal charge or indictment. This is not how indictments work. They are not brought in public for the first time. And the New Testament shows us that the Sanhedrin had already determined to crucify him. So there's no way Jesus was going to get a fair or impartial trial. Most people don't realize that. Number six says this, the indictments against Jesus were false or unproven. Remember this? What exactly were the charges against Jesus? Remember when he was standing before the Sanhedrin, the charge was blasphemy. Remember that. In Mark 14, 15, two witnesses, false witnesses come up and they actually misquote Jesus saying he's going to destroy the temple. 
If you think about this, the very fact that the Sanhedrin went looking for witnesses to accuse Jesus has the entire procedure backwards. That is not how it's supposed to work. The witnesses come, they bring charges, then a formal indictment is made, then a trial can begin. There should have been two or three witnesses. They should have agreed on the details. They didn't. But according to Scripture, this is not the standard. Yet the Sanhedrin said, hey, good enough. I'm tearing my robes. What more truth do we need? When Caiaphas tore his robes, by the way, he is making a statement that this man is guilty, and he has not even ruled. He's not even supposed to do it. He is declaring himself no longer impartial, but he's clearly taking a side. Number seven tells us the verdict was suddenly unanimous. Now, this might seem a little counterintuitive to you like it did to me. The first time I, I thought about this, when we hear that a, a, a verdict or a jury came together and was unanimous, we think, oh, that's great. They're all in one accord. All in. That's not how rabbinical law viewed this. Rabbinical law said just the opposite. They said there shouldn't be a unanimous decision that happens quickly. See, we think intuitively, well, it's an open and shut case, right? Boom, slam, it's done, let's do it. But as one scholar writes, he says this, rabbinic law says, and for very good reasons, a verdict of guilty must not be rendered on the same day of the examination. Did you know that? It must not be rendered. If all suddenly agree, does that not seem that he could be the victim of a conspiracy? Does it not throw doubt on he could be railroaded? The verdict is not the result of sober reason and calm deliberation if it is rushed. It makes a great point. Sudden, overwhelming unity should be suspicious. Which leads us to number eight. I love this. Jesus was not given a defense. But their law required he got a defender. You don't see that. There was no defender. Where was his advocate? Think about this. Nowhere. Jesus stood there all alone. Your blameless, innocent Savior, stripped of his dignity, was punched and slapped and beaten and blindfolded and mocked. And he stood there alone. Not even a disciple dared come to his aid. The Mishnah says, if none of the judges defend the accused, as in they all pronounce him guilty like they did here, having no defender in court, then the verdict of guilty is invalid. What? Should have been dismissed again right there? The sentence of death cannot be executed. We go back and look at our own Torah. We look at Deuteronomy 13, 14. The high priest is instructed. He is commanded to re require a, a deep search, to ask diligent questions, and to inquire, to defend, and make a serious consideration. They did just the opposite with Jesus. But yet they did make an attempt to find people to condemn him. They certainly weren't looking for defenders. Imagine how Jesus must have felt to stand there and think, I have done so much for these people. And not a single person stands with me. Remember, fully God, but he was fully man. Imagine what he must have felt. The second to last one I have, a death sentence could only be passed in a legal court. This is what the Jewish law states. It says, after leaving the gazith, all right, the gazith was the, ter the, the technical term for the hall of hewn stones. It's where they carved out these square blocks where the Sanhedrin was supposed to make their, it would be like our Supreme Court hall. This is where they sat, where they gathered, and they made their verdicts from this point. Remember that. No sentence of death can be passed upon anyone whatsoever except in the appointed place. Think about what they did. This was a capital case. This was supposed to be huge. And the Sanhedrin, with every member present, was required to meet at the temple of the Gazith, right there in the hall of the hewn stones. No capital sentence could be pronounced outside of this place. But according to Scripture... They announced all this in a guy's front yard. They were over in Caiaphas' courtyard. But this last one is so bizarre to me. I want you to look closely. Number 10 says, they switched charges when they stood before Pilate. This is huge. If you have doubts about your faith, if you're not sure what Jesus is, who he says he is, I want you to look at, look at how they treated and how they reacted to him, to try, to try to snare him. In the early hours of Jesus' trial, treason was never mentioned. Remember what the charge was, right? blasphemy. They knew Rome didn't care about blasphemy laws. And they knew they had better get something trumped up to get Rome involved. 
There's no way they were going to authorize a crucifixion based on blasphemy, right? That's a small crime. That would be like Jesus being arrested. They bring him up, and all the, all the leaders are like, oh, he's a bad man. You need to kill him. You need to kill him. What was his crime? He, he, he stole a candy bar. And the judge like, well, do what? Is that a capital offense now? Oh, he, he didn't steal a candy bar. He, he killed the shop owner. That's it. He murdered this guy. Do you see what happened? They did a bait and switch. They knew blasphemy meant nothing to Rome. Oh, but treason? They were terrified of that. And when they hear that a new king is coming, that is something Rome would care about. But here's a bonus oddity for you. Pilate, when he weighed the evidence, brings out a bowl of water, and he washes his hands and says, this guy is in no way guilty of treason. I'm done with it. Do it yourself, right? He tries to absolve himself. He knows he's not guilty of treason. You see that in John 18 and 19, right here in Matthew 27. And there's so many more strange and dubious things where the members of the Sanhedrin disqualified themselves. You know, we've got Caiaphas tearing his robes. This action, he's taking a stand. He's no longer impartial. We've got the assault. We forget about this. Can you imagine today in a courtroom having court TV pull back and people are coming up and they're just knocking this guy silly and beating him and tying blindfolds on him and poking and pulling his beard out and slapping him and make, spitting on him? Can you imagine what the legal experts would do? That case would be dismissed in a heartbeat, but this is what happened in plain sight of all these supposed leaders. There was no justice happening here. And my question is, why? Acts chapter 2 has the answer. Look at it with me. This is so amazing. Verse 22 says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. He's putting it out there. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. Whoa. Did you catch that? And you, with the help of wicked men, all right, so now we know what, what the psalm says. Was this wicked? With the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God, there, I love it. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it is impossible for death to keep his hold on Jesus. This passage reminds us that God is sovereign. Never forget that, church. God is sovereign. He is always in control of his universe. And this shows us these men acted in wickedness, but this was still according to God's deliberate plan that would lead to our redemption. You see how magnificent this whole orchestrated thing is? The Apostle Peter takes this even further, even deeper. He says this in 1 Peter 3. He says, for it is better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. What? For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Why? To bring you to God. Thank you, Lord, for what you went through. But the Pharisees weren't done here. The Pharisees, Jesus is crucified. He's killed, no doubt. Laid in a tomb, sealed up. I want you to check out what the Pharisees do next. Because the religious leaders, they're, they're not done. In Matthew 27, we read this. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they go back to Pilate. Listen to how polite they are. Uh, sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver, there's, there's their bias again, said, after three days I will rise again. So here's what we want you to do. Look how they're manipulating him. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until that third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body. And tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. Oh, this last deception will be worse than the first. Look what Pilate does. He gives in. He says, all right, take a guard. Go. Make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went, and they made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. All right, this is not some mall cop, overweight dude sitting there with a stun gun. This is up to 16 trained Roman soldiers. All of them are elite. They're there, and they're standing in a semicircle. What, if you have never really researched this, four of the 16 must be on red alert at all times. They must be completely sober-minded. They take four-hour shifts, and they cannot sleep. They cannot rest. They cannot eat. They cannot take a drink. They are on guard. 
The other 12 have to be in a semicircle behind them, facing inward with their backs to what they are reportedly guarding. You got this? It was designed to be an intimidating sight. It was designed to be impressive so that no one would even dare approach whatever they're guarding. So you've got these 16 people standing there. Every four hours, you have four fresh soldiers on watch. Think about this. So the first sign that I want us to look at here are the soldiers. This is a resurrection piece of evidence that people gloss right over. Because when the women arrive on resurrection morning, Scripture says there were no soldiers. Wait, what? What happened? Something happened. We read it. Earthquake happened, an angel came, rolled the stone away, sat on it, it was far away, it wasn't just like just slightly up the hill where they could peek in. It was this incredible thing. The soldiers knew something was up because Matthew 28, 11 says, while they were going, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all the things that had happened. What had happened? The tomb was empty, Jesus was gone, and the soldiers knew it. Don't miss that. Not only do the soldiers know the truth, I guarantee you those religious leaders were getting nervous. Because they knew something had happened. We have evidence of a cover-up. And what do they say? The cover-up is always worse than the crime, right? You know, look at verse 12. Check this out. He says, and when they, the Pharisees, had assembled with the, the, old, the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. This is a bribe. Bribing them, saying, tell them this. His disciples came at night, and they stole him away while we slept. And if this gets back to the governor, okay, if the governor's mad, don't worry, we'll appease him. We'll take it. We'll protect it. Do you believe these guys? I can't believe the soldiers went along with this. But it says they do. They took the money. They did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among Jews till this day. So the idea that the disciples stole the body of Jesus is almost impossible. It's totally illogical for two main reasons. The first one is this. It is impossible that the soldiers would have all slept to the disciples' racket of trying to move a stone which was estimated to weigh one and a half to two tons. They were there standing in front. Can you imagine trying to get it? Get it and an estimated to 20 people needed to move this at one time. Once it had been dropped into that trough, it was designed not to move again. So they're there. Imagine the disciples trying to step over these bodies. Don't wake them. Peter, you're being too loud. Come on, somebody help. You're not even trying, you know. And, imagine, and they somehow move that, and not one soldier wakes up to see that. Which is the second thing that I find mind-blowing. If all the soldiers were asleep, how'd they know who stole the body? Did you ever think of that? If they were all asleep, then how can they specifically blame the disciples? I thought you said you were sleeping. You didn't see... Y'all remember that great scene in Pirates of the Caribbean where they're trying to scare Captain Jack Sparrow? And they're telling him all these things, oh, that ship, they're in jail, they're looking out. You don't want to get caught, go put on that ship. Everyone goes on there, dies. Nobody ever makes it off alive. And Johnny Depp has this great thing. He says, there were no survivors? Huh, I wonder where the stories came from then. Hmm, I wonder how the stories got out. If everybody was killed and everybody died. Guys, if all the soldiers were asleep, how did they know who stole the body? Another sign of evidence we should consider is the seal. As you get close to the tomb, you would see two ropes stretched across at least with wax affixed to it. The Roman soldier would put his signet into it saying, I hereby declare this tomb sealed. What is purported to be inside is verified it is inside. That's when they turn their backs to it and all 16 of the regiment are guarding it. This is something that also was not there when the women came. There, there was no uh, seal when they came. The next thing is the stone. This had to be the most frightening thing of all when they come up and they notice not only is Jesus' tomb open, the stone is gone. This thing was huge. This gigantic piece of granite, usually it was round, was rolled in front to stop animals from getting in and, how do I say it, desecrating a tomb. How about that? It would stop it. It would also stop vandalism and thief and it would protect the dignity of whoever was buried inside. It was so massive that they said up to 20 people could be used to move this. Once it's in place, it rolls down into this groove that has been there because it was never designed to be moved again. But when the women came, listen to Matthew 28, what happened. It's very explicit. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came, rolled back the stone from the door, and sat on it. But what I love about this 
when John uses the describing words, he actually uses a Greek word that means to pick something up and carry it away. And then you see the angel sitting on it, almost in like a triumphant thing, like, take that, Satan. What you meant for bad, you have no idea what you've just unleashed. And he's sitting there, almost like, like a victorious grin, this angel. Obviously, something miraculous was happening. The next piece of evidence we miss is the sepulcher, the tomb itself. When we study Luke's account, we read, not only did the women find the stone rolled away, not only did they find the body of the Lord not there, they sit there, they look, and they have two men show up. They say he was in white garments. They say, why are you here looking for the living among the dead? He's not risen. Remember, I mean, he is risen. He's not here. Remember how he told you this while he was still with you in Galilee? When you looked inside the tomb, there was no body. So somebody had to get past the soldiers, past the seal, past the stone. Yet all that security of the sepulcher, Jesus' body is missing. Almost. The tomb is almost empty. There's one thing we forget. The shroud. The grave clothes. John 20, 3 through 8 says this. Before Peter therefore leaves with the other disciple, this is John, and they're going to the tomb, okay? So they both ran together. John outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down, looked in, saw the linen clothes lying there, but he didn't go in. Finally, Simon Peter, who was slower, comes up following him. He goes into the tomb. He doesn't wait. And he sees the linen cloth lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head was now folded, lying with the linen cloth in a place by itself. Then John, who came to the tomb first, finally went in, and he saw, and he believed. Any of you have been watching The Chosen? I'll tell you what, it is so awesome to see how they show some of the uh, friendly rivalry between the disciples. And as I was researching, I saw this meme which shows John and Peter. He got to the tomb first. I won. Well, who's going to know? Everyone will know. You know why? Because it's written in Scripture. John outran him. We still talk about this. When Peter and John looked into the grave, the tomb was almost empty. There wasn't a body, but there was a shroud. See, we forget that back then they didn't wear a suit. They didn't wear a robe to be buried in. They were almost what we would consider like mummified. They had wraps of linen around them with spices in between multiple layers. So when they looked in, they saw what probably looked like a slightly indented body, a figure that had almost like a, a caterpillar who had left its cocoon. Maybe it was slightly indented, but it was in the shape of a body, but it was still wrapped. What thief unwraps a body and purposely wraps it perfectly back up with all the spices and leaves it in the same shape? It is incredible. And it says there, that is when John looked in and he believed. There was something that happened. I can just imagine John saying, Peter, don't you see? Not even the grave clothes have been touched. Something has happened. They're lying exactly like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea left them. He's not here. The body hasn't been stolen. It's not been moved. He's alive, and I believe. Think about this. So following that experience, instead of these two being cowardly, they're now courageous. They run back, and they turn the world upside down. And that's what the book of Acts is all about. So cool, so exciting. They notice the resurrection is now the central theme that they will preach. This is huge. But the next thing they see are the scars, because Jesus shows back up. If you're new to the faith, this gets missed a lot. Jesus has appeared now, not once, but twice, to the disciples. They're in an upper room. They're locked but the first time Jesus appears, one of them's missing. Anybody remember his name? Old Thomas, Doubting Thomas. He says, I don't believe it, guys. I don't know if you saw some mass hallucination. I don't know what you're on, but I won't believe it until I see it and touch him. Well, guess what Jesus did eight days later? He shows up in a locked room, through the door, walks through the walls, freaks them out. You can read it all about yourself. And he says, Thomas, come here, buddy. Come here. I want you to touch my scars. Put your hand and feel it. I have flesh and bone. I want you to put your hand on the side where the soldier's spear pierced it. Spirits and ghosts don't have flesh and bone as you see I have. And Thomas's reaction was awesome. He said, my Lord and my God. And he believed something had happened. This 
is legitimate. Thomas knew he'd seen the risen Savior. He saw the scars on Jesus' body. And probably my favorite evidence, this is the last one, we'll leave here, were the sightings. Even beyond the scars, beyond the stone, beyond the sepulcher, beyond all those words I gave you that start with the letter S, probably the most incredible thing to me are the sightings. Not only the disciples saw him, now on two separate occasions, but men and women saw him. Children, adults saw him. Individuals saw him alone. Groups saw him. They saw him in the morning time. They saw him at evening. In every situation you could possibly imagine, the risen Jesus was seen. And on Easter, I'm going to go into this. In 1 Corinthians, you'll see that Paul says Jesus revealed himself on one occasion to more than 500 people at the same time. Remember, hallucinations are not mass events. 500 people. Most of them were still alive when Paul wrote this. So they could have easily refuted this. All those 500 people had to do was say, uh, Paul, what are you talking about? We didn't see him. You're lying. Stone him. They didn't. Not a single person in all of recorded history came forward out of that 500 group and they said, Paul, you're lying. They certainly could have refuted his statement if they chose to. Now to grasp how many people really saw Jesus alive, the math is unbelievable. If we were to bring the witnesses up here and you became the court today and each witness came up and we only gave them six minutes to testify, just six minutes to speak, it would result in more than 50 hours of testimony that Christ was seen alive. 50 hours. Okay? So that would be if we started right now testifying. 1130 to 1130 midnight to 1130 tomorrow morning. 11.30 midnight night after, to 11.30 in the afternoon or late morning on Tuesday, plus two more hours. That's a long time. In fact, I think I'm going to preach that long right now. We're going to try. No, we won't do that. <laughs> think about this. That's how, much, that's how many people. Y'all, there is so much evidence for Jesus being who he is, who he says he is, who the word of God says he is. We have every right to be bold this season. We have every every possible edifying piece of evidence to stand on. We know now Jesus is alive and well. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, Scripture says, interceding for us. And one day, probably sooner than a lot of people expect, he's going to return. Are you ready? Is your family ready? Is your neighbors ready? This is why we prayed yesterday for so long, walking up and down, God, would you please bring these lost sons and daughters home? Let the scales fall from their eyes so they see the truth. There's a stat that I love to bring up this time of year because there's a season of the soul. There's an openness among people who don't know Jesus right now. And it's from Tom Rainer. He wrote the book, The Unchurched Person Next Door. And he said this, 82% of the unchurched are at least somewhat likely or very likely to attend church this Easter season if they're invited. You know why? Because face-to-face -face interaction is the highest form a customer can give. A satisfied customer gives a review on Yelp and it goes viral, or the opposite. Think about this. What is God doing in your life? What in your sphere is he laying on your heart right now? Who is that person? Who is that family member? You have a season of soul. You have the opportunity. We just heard just a little of the evidence. Next week, if you have a lost person, bring them. I can't, I'm so excited about these next two weeks. And on Easter especially, I mean, it's here. Palm Sunday, then Easter. Who is God laying on your heart? There's somebody. That is your challenge today. As we go, I want us to pray that God will lay somebody on your heart and he will open that door that you can go and you can share, hey, I'm one beggar telling another beggar where I found food. Will you come? I'll, I'll tell you, I'll sit with you. Make it as easy as possible. Enough. Salvation hangs in the balance for somebody. Just like somebody cared for you, it's our turn to reach out to be those kind of disciples. All right, let's stand together. I'm going to pray for you. We'll be dismissed. You guys were awesome. Thank you for hanging with me. I told you it was like drinking from a fire hose. Woo! Love it. All right, let's pray together. God, we pray that you would put that person in our heart, and we would lay it before your throne, and we would just intercede and cry out for their salvation. Lord, that revival that is, that is blowing across so many nations, God, do it here. I pray, God, that you would give us that divine appointment. I pray that you would let the scales fall off their eyes, that they are being blinded, or the deceiver has them believing falsehoods or lies or half-truths about you, our Savior. 
I pray that you would give us the boldness, the words, Holy Spirit, speak through us. You can use any kind of testimony, but you can't use a non-testimony. So I pray, God, that we would open our mouth and you would give us those words. We would be fearless and speak the truth that's in our heart. God, you are so good to us. Thank you for the privilege to study your word. Thank you for the, the truths that we see that edify us and confirm you are who you say you are. May we leave this place with boldness, with joy, with laughter like the disciples, knowing you are risen. You are the Savior, and we love you. And we pray this in your powerful name. And all God's children said, amen and amen. God bless you guys. Love you. Have a great week. Keep praying for that person. I'll see you next week.